and welcome to South Asia Chat, a podcast series brought to you by the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. I'm your host, Nitya Subramanian, an editor at the Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mark Leonard, co-founder and director of the European Council on Foreign Relations, the first pan-European think tank. He is the author of four books, including an edited volume, has been honored as young global leader of the World Economic Forum and advises governments and institutions on the big geopolitical trends of the century. But today we will be discussing his latest book titled The Age of Unpeace, How Connectivity Causes Conflict. This book argues that although there is greater connectivity today, be it via trade, technology, the internet or travel, all of which envisage the formation of a global village These are also giving countries a reason to fight one another and an arsenal of weapons from cyber attacks and sanctions to fake news and weaponized vaccines. The theme raises many interesting questions. So without further ado, let me welcome Dr. Vianad to our podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for inviting me. Your book, The Age of Unpeace, How Connectivity Causes Conflict, seems to turn upside down the concept of how important and crucial connectivity is in modern times by talking about the conflicts that it can create. What prompted you to write this book? You also say that it started with a sense of despair but ended with some hope. (laughs) So I am somebody who was brought up to believe that growing interdependence um, was a a kind of core way of, of trying to move towards a more peaceful world. And um, as somebody who uh, grew up in Europe, I've seen how building interdependence between different countries, starting with a coal and steel community and gradually expanding it to a common market and a single currency, you could turn enemies into friends. And uh, the hope was that we could do that at a global level by getting rid of, of borders, having more and more trade between countries, binding people together with roads and railways and cheap travel. And uh, the hope was that the Internet could create some sort of global public sphere, which would allow us to to work out what to do with all the big problems that we face together, like climate and, and pandemics and other kinds of things like that. Um, But what I realized over time is that many of the hopes we had at the turn of the century, at the turn of the millennium, um, were somehow uh, being undermined by events in the real world. And the real shock, the biggest shock to me was 2016, when two of the most globalized countries that had done the most to push for liberalization ended up having massive political backlashes against it. First, in the UK, you had Brexit where a majority of people voted against being members of the European Union. And then across the pond, uh, American people voted for Donald Trump as as president. And what that did was got me to to kind of think through a lot of my assumptions, because many of the things that in my own life I felt were giving me more freedom, more opportunity um, and making my life better seem to exactly those same things where it being interpreted as in a negative way by, by by the people who voted for Brexit and for Trump. They saw everything that I saw bringing opportunity as bringing vulnerability. They saw all of the things that gave me a sense of security um, as, as making them feel insecure. And that kind of led me down a, a sort of path of, of, of discovery. And what I found to my surprise is that um, these phenomena are, are fundamentally double-sided and that all of the good things about connectivity are inextricably linked with some bad things. And as, as you said, I, what I discovered was that connectivity, as well as um, creating uh, you know, greater empathetic uh, bonds between people across the planet, has uh, gives people a motive for conflict in various different ways. It, it um, creates... Uh, polarization in our societies as people uh, flock together into kind of new identity groups and there's more conflict between them and we have filter bubbles don't share the same facts anymore. It's created an epidemic of envy as people compare themselves to other people around the world, both at an individual level where 
everybody now can compare themselves to idealized images of the perfect life in other places, which is very different from when I was growing up, when you compared yourself to your neighbors or maybe your parents or your grandparents, but not to people on the other side of the world in that kind of relentless way. But even at the level of governments, the same sort of things happening in COVID, we had sort of daily league tables about how every country was performing. And these things bring out competitive instincts rather than competition. And another kind of part of that is that actually this process of convergence, which I think has happened as a result of globalization, which we thought would, would make the world more peaceful and, and create greater harmony, seems to be in fact having the opposite effect. It often makes people even more competitive. And China and America, for example, which is one of the big stories of my book, I think got on much better when they were much more different to each other. And this process of convergence has, has meant that they're fighting over their, their, their similarities as much as their. So that was the first kind of challenge that, that it creates a, a motive for conflict. Secondly, it creates an opportunity for conflict. What had been happening over the last few decades is that war had becoming more and more expensive, so expensive that it's very difficult to imagine a great power war between two nuclear powers. But what connectivity does is allows you the chance to interfere in each other's affairs and to hurt one another without provoking a nuclear conflict. And that's why I think you've seen a sort of proliferation of low cost conflict that falls beneath the, the bar of war. And that's why I talk about this, the book as the age of unpeace, because I think Tolstoy's era where you had these long periods of peace punctuated by wars that's over now what you have is perpetual conflict but it's below the kind of thresholds of normal war and that brings me to the third thing which is what, what you kind of mentioned as well that um the fact that we're so closely bound together gives us a whole arsenal of weapons with which we can hurt each other and the metaphor i use in the book is of a a, a, a loveless marriage that goes wrong and in a marriage it's the things that bring the couple together in the good times that become the tools which they use to hurt each other in the bad times. So in a marriage, it's about, you know, who gets custody of the of the pet dog, who gets the holiday home, how you bring up the kids and turn them against uh, each other. But in geopolitics, it's more about the different points of contact which bind us together, which have become tools for, for geopolitical influence, whether it's about trade, which turns more into sanctions or uh, the internet, which becomes a, a site for cyber war or for misinformation campaigns, or even migration. We've been reading a lot in the, the press recently about how Belarus and Turkey have tried to use migration as a weapon to get countries to, to do other things. And, and that is quite a, a, a scary um, change to the way that we thought about globalization, because rather than creating this sort of sense of harmony and shared interest, it's the asymmetries in the system which which allow uh, people to exercise power and become a source of vulnerability for everybody um, who are worried that these connections uh, won't just make them rich, but could also make them uh, into potential victims of, of blackmail, exploitation um, or worse from, from other countries. Uh, you basically touched upon many points that I would like to discuss uh, in a little greater detail. Um, now, you did mention that connectivity has fragmented our society, our politics, and even people to a great extent. Um, but also, there are the other five big driving forces of interdependence, the economy, infrastructure, technology, migration, and international institutions being turned into weapons. So could you talk a little more about this aspect? Sure. So um, what we thought at the beginning of this century, when you had all these advocates for globalization and people like Thomas Friedman, who wrote this book called The World is Flat, using India actually as the kind of yes. absolute archetype, showing how you had these supply chains which would bind the world together and knock down the kind of borders and the iPhone, uh, you know, or Dell computer. In fact, it was Dell computers that he used as the sort of ultimate metaphor, yeah. which were produced in dozens of countries around the world and things going backwards and forwards between different places. Um, that turns out to be a, a kind of overly stylized way of how networks work. And if you kind of look at network theory, you realize that networks are rarely flat because um they are rarely symmetrical. And what you find in our world, which is interlaced by all these complicated networks, is that 
um, some countries are more connected than others, that some relationships are more one-sided than others, and that those asymmetries, in fact, allow the people who are the most connected to act as, as gatekeepers, shutting other countries out of the system. Um, they can blackmail other players if the other ones need them more than, than they do. And um, there are other kind of uh, ways that you can use these networks to infiltrate uh, other players. And anyway, in the book, I look at the sort of seven habits of, of, of successful mm -hmm. connectivity warriors and show through network theory how all the different ways that you can try and exercise power. And then that's now happened in each of these big areas that we thought would bring the world together. So in the economy, the hope was that we would create almost a sort of common economic structure by having these deep networks of, of um, uh, these supply chains and, and free trade and economic interdependence. But what we're seeing increasingly is that that is becoming a battleground with sanctions, with entities lists where people are restricting the exports of certain technologies. We're seeing sort of competing trade blocks emerging. It's, it's becoming uh, a much more geopolitical space. This, that's happening even more so in the tech sector where um, you know, country, companies like Huawei and Google used to work together really well and then geopolitics comes in and uh, this becomes the kind of front line of the, the debate. Um, infrastructure, we've seen these big debates about China's Belt and Road Initiative, and people are worried that China is, is trying to bind people into a relationship of dependence with Beijing and that that will undermine their sovereignty either because they get into debt with China because they borrow money to, to build things or because China can sort of manipulate them in other ways. And the same is true, you know, the Internet, as I said before, we all these debates about misinformation campaigns and cyber attacks. Um, and even migration, the free movement of people, is becoming something which people are thinking about in power terms and trying to benefit from it in different ways. And that's quite a quite a, a big change. And finally, we had international law and international institutions, which were meant to be creating some sort of um, fair, just system, which which invigilated this, which was outside of of power games but in fact those things have now become part of the power game as well and that's why people talk about lawfare um as well where people are manipulating the the rule of law and institutions to to exercise power over each other uh, now going back to your reference or your allusion to the loveless marriage uh, which is with regard to geopolitics or the great power politics um could you share more insights into that thought and how has this been affecting countries around the world and how does the new topography of power look like? So um, I think the, the, the loveless marriage, you know, is uh, a metaphor because I think people's emotions around connectivity have changed quite a lot. And that is one of the things which is driving um, this new atmosphere that we're in at the moment. So at the turn of the century, there was very much an idea that globalization was a win-win thing and that everybody benefited from it. And I think the big story of the last few years, which came out strongly from Brexit and, and Trump, but actually increasingly all over the world, there is a sense that there are losers as well as winners and that some people are being left behind, that enormous riches have been created, but that they haven't been distributed very fairly. Um, and now we're sort of living with the, the sort of backlash against that. And we're much more conscious of the ways that people are suffering as a result of connectivity. And it's the, those people who feel that they're suffering. It doesn't even necessarily mean that they're suffering in absolute terms. They might just be suffering in relative terms. Certainly in America and in Europe, many people's wages have stagnated. So they've gone back in relative terms. But they also just have a sense that they're no longer in the cockpit of history. And I think, you know, most people in most countries um, have experienced colonialism, have known what it was like to live in circumstances where important decisions were being made many miles away, which didn't reflect indigenous needs and circumstances. And now that's being felt very strongly in the former imperial metropoles like <laughs> London <laughs> and, in, and in the US. And I think that's part of the reason that, that it's become sort of loveless, that we're stuck together. We like all the convenience and the benefits of globalization, but we don't like the downsides. And people are more and more aware of, of how they've become um, objects rather than subjects of their history. 
Um, you also oh, then, sorry, you asked about the new topography of power. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, so in the new so that what if you look at the, I mean, it goes a bit back to what we were saying before about the structure of networks. You often have some players that are much more connected to others and they have hubs and they can become gatekeepers um, in this in the system. You have some players who are much more uh, dependent, you know, for example, um, on energy. Um, you know, if you have countries mm -hmm. like uh, Russia, uh, they can cut um, other countries off from their pipelines and use that to blackmail them. But at the same time, um, countries with big markets like the European Union is threatening to, to introduce carbon border, border adjustment mechanisms, which can allow uh, people to be shut off. So in each of the different domains I'm talking about, you have uh, slightly differently ordered networks. And that is the, the new topography of power. The people who are central to the system, those who are on the periphery, those who have lots of options and those who don't have options. And all these things create power dynamics. When we, uh, when we talk about connectivity, that seems to be uh, central to the power struggle between the US and China, whether, as you rightly mentioned, the Belt and Road Initiative or 5G. Going forward, how do you see this play between the two countries? I think that in many ways, you know, this is the battle, these are the battlegrounds where it's going to be fought out of. It's not impossible that there'll be a war over Taiwan or a war over some sort of atoll in the South China Sea. But I hope that we're going to manage to avoid a sort of nuclear confrontation over those issues. What is much harder to see us avoiding is the, the weaponization of everything else. And that is very scary. It creates a, a very uncertain world, not just for the US and China, but for everyone else who threatens to get caught in the crossfires of this. And it makes it very difficult for us to see how we can carry on with a lot of the economic models and, and other ways of thinking about um, our communications, about our, uh, our education systems, our labor markets, which have been central to, to, to the world over the last few decades. And that's one of the, the scariest things about how connectivity is being weaponized. It affects everyone from students sitting in universities to tech companies trying to work out how to manufacture products to, um, you know, neighborhoods that have benefited from, from mutual investment in different areas. Um, and it means that the sorts of political and security decisions that you had in very high tech sectors, you know, if you were a defense company now become uh, broadened out to almost every single part of the economy and even universities who find themselves, you know, having to make geopolitical decisions about whether they can have a, a kind of research um, collaboration with a, with, with a like-minded uh, institute uh, in, in areas which feel like they're a long way from geopolitics, like cancer research, you know, things which are about benefiting the future of humanity. So this brings me to my last question. Um, in the book, you said that we are now entering a period of perpetual unpeace. So what steps do you think we can take to, dis to, to disarm connectivity and avoid a catastrophe? Because we seem to be so interconnected now that it might be difficult to actually disconnect. I totally agree. So that's basically... The, the big finding that I had through this process, I, I, at the beginning, I thought I was going to write a book arguing for openness because everyone was saying the big challenge of our times is between open versus closed. But actually, what I realized is, A, that's a false choice. Nobody wants to go back to a world with none of the connections because we'll lose out on, on centuries worth of, uh, of, of civilizational improvements and improvements to our everyday life. At the same time, unless we face up to the dangers which are inherent in, in this connectivity, we could end up destroying the planet and ourselves and creating a huge amount of, of unhappiness um, in the world. So I argued that the big divide is not so much between open and closed, it's more between managed and unmanaged connectivity. And that what we need to try and do is to to diffuse the, conf the conflictual um, elements embedded in connectivity. So if the Cold War was largely, the, the, the nightmare scenario in the Cold War was about a nuclear conflict, 
that led to disarmament uh, and arms control being the, the way that you dealt with it. In our age, it's much harder because it's not just about a few weapons and technologies that you can get your hands on. If everything can be weaponized, the question is, how can we go about rethinking these connections so that they are less likely to, to, to end up in, in sort of conflict? And I lay out a sort of five-step therapy plan from, uh, you know, facing up to the fact there is a problem, thinking about what healthy boundaries look like, um, being realistic about what we can control so you don't have a kind of crazy civilizational struggle about every single point of, of contact, thinking about self-care and how we strengthen ourselves and make ourselves more resilient. And above all, and most difficultly, thinking about how you get real consent for these connections. I think one of the reasons there's been a backlash is that people feel that connectivity has been done to them rather than them having control over their lives. So that sounds quite abstract, but when you take it into specific areas, whether it's trade policy or thinking about how we organize the internet or thinking even about what citizenship laws we have in our countries, I think there is a very concrete agenda that, that flows from these things. And the, the, the main point is that we start thinking about it before we end up in a, in a catastrophic scenario, because I think that politics can make the world a lot safer um, once we're more aware of the problems. But part of the, the challenge is that we've been in denial about the dark side of globalization and um, thought that, uh, that we were in a win-win world. And that's left many people angry um, and uh, resentful and uh, has also created a lot of, you know, there, there's a huge amount of, 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 of human toll around the world because war these days doesn't really affect very many people. More people commit suicide every year than get killed in armed conflicts. But there are hundreds of millions of people who have been victims of these connectivity conflicts that, that I've been talking about with you earlier in the podcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Leonard, for joining us today. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. It's a real pleasure talking to you. You were listening to South Asia Chat. To learn more about our work, visit us at isas.nus.edu.sg. Also follow us on our social media handles, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you.